We're at Nevei Yushalayim doing the Mystical Hebrew Alphabet series. We've worked through the letters Aleph and Bet. Aleph represents God's oneness. It's the only silent letter of the alphabet. Bet, we said before, is the letter of connection or relationship, positive or negative. Tunis always represents connection or relationship. And now, we're going to be working on the letter Gimel. So to work on the letter Gimel, we have to go back to the idea of Tunis. We're going to talk about when Tunis is negative or disconnected. Like marriage represents connective tunis, divorce represents disconnective tunis. Uh, peace and, and uh, positive relationships between countries are connective, war is disconnective. So when we're dealing with disconnective tunis, um, the problem with disconnective tunis is it, it makes it very hard to be a decision maker. Free will and decision making is very difficult in a world that's too disconnected. Uh, the example that's uh, the easiest is if I tell you the library is open on Wednesdays and you say, oh, good, I have a library book I have to return. So then I say, well, one second, the library is closed on Wednesdays. So now you don't know what to do with your library book. Is the library open on Wednesdays or closed on Wednesdays? Doesn't seem to make any sense anymore. That's an example of disconnected tunis. What do I do with my book this Wednesday? Can I return it or can I? He said the library is open. He said the library is closed. So when the Torah wants to deal with the issue of disconnected tunis, it doesn't deal with libraries being open or closed. It deals with the first two interactions that God has with creation that we can track. And those first two interactions God has with creation, which seem disconnected, are really exemplified by the first two builders of the Jewish people, the first two patriarchs, Abraham and Isaac, who we're going to call Abraham and Yitzchak. So if we put Abraham over here, Abraham models his worldview after the first interaction between God and his creation that is trackable, and that is the interaction we know as you know what uh, Avram spent his life trying to perfect? It's the interaction we call chesed. Chesed is the term for giving. Chesed is, I love you, I care about you, what can I do for you? In a world of chesed, and, and Avram spends his life trying to perfect chesed. He goes around, you know, being a giver. How can I feed you, clothe you, educate you about God and Judaism. So Avram's chief strategy is a chesed-based strategy. In a chesed-based world, if I say, God, please, I need a car, I got to get to work, I got to take my kids to school, I got to visit the sick, take food to the poor, can I have a car? God says, I love you, here, take a Cadillac or a BMW or whatever. That's a chesed-based system. God loves me and he gives to me. Now, what's the problem with a pure chesed-based system? Uh, it sounds fun. God loves me, so he gives me everything, but it can be destructive. Pure chesed becomes destructive chesed. Um, you know, if I say to my son, here, take my car keys, take my credit card, stay out tonight, stay out as late as you want, do whatever you want. I don't care if you're 12 years old, you deserve it. So that's tremendous chesed, but I'll destroy my child because that's terrible for a child. So too much chesed. For example, in the Torah, rain is often looked at as chesed because it causes things to grow. It causes um, us to be able to have what to drink, stay alive. But if God loves you so much that the rain doesn't stop, everybody drowns. It's called a flood. So Avraham works on perfecting chesed. We'll call that the example of the library is open on Wednesdays. But um, too much chesed can be... Uh, destructive. What's a hint of that in Abraham's home? Well, if we put up our genealogy, we'll see that Abraham created a Yitzchak, who was the builder of the Jewish people. Abraham marries Sarah. But he also has to throw out another one of his sons named Yishmael, who is from a maidservant named Hagar. So that could be a hint that a pure chesed home uh, doesn't always work for everybody. And therefore, one of his sons get thrown out. Um, 
So that's a chesed basis. And the question you have to ask is, why did Abraham adopt a chesed-based strategy to try to perfect his entire lifetime? And the answer could be logistical. The reason why Abraham worked on building up being a giver as opposed to emulating any one of God's traits, right? God is uh, slow to anger and God is, there's all sorts of traits we see that are godlike. The reason why Abraham focused on chesed could have been for a simple logistical reason, and that is that uh, he, since he was the first person to reject idolatry and adopt monotheism, so once he realizes that all these gods make no sense, they can't ultimately be powerful, there must be one god up there, um, he probably you know, looked in the mirror and said, well, what do I do now? Because there was, where he grew up in an idolatrous country, there was no information there for him to use to try to have a relationship with this God who he knows is up there. So it could have been simply that Abraham went through the following logical process, which led to a, a chesed strategy. He said, listen, if there is one God up there and that God is perfect and has no needs or lacks, then why did God create the universe? Why did God put human beings here? It wasn't for entertainment value. God wasn't bored. What's the whole point? So it must be, since God gets nothing from creation and nothing from human beings, because God's infinitely perfect, then that's an indicator that God's a perfect giver. He's willing to create a universe with billions of galaxies, and he's willing to put human beings in there for nothing in return because he's a perfect giver. So therefore, Aram says, okay, I could do that. If I want to be more like God, I could work on my giving. So that's probably why Abraham picks the chesed strategy to emulate God and become more like God as opposed to one of the other attributes he could have emulated. It just would have made sense at that stage of his development of a relationship with God. So that is called a pure chesed system. That would be the library is open on Wednesdays, and that's going to be in contradiction with the next system. The next system is the one that Yitzchak, Isaac, Abraham's son, adopts. Yitzchak does not emulate his father's strategy of going around trying to feed, clothe, and educate uh, all the Canaanites about God and monotheism. He says, if I do that, I'll destroy myself. I'm not my father. I can't do that strategy. So Yitzchak picks a different strategy. Are you familiar with Anyone familiar with Yitzchak's strategy? He doesn't work on chesed his entire lifetime. He works on a strategy called din. Din is rules, and din is setting limits. A court in Hebrew is called a bait, a house of din, a bait din or a base din. It's a house of rules. Rules and limitations are the second interaction we can track between God and his creation. Yitzchak is going to develop that aspect of his personality by focusing on perfecting himself through rules and limitations, right? In a chesed-based system, I say, please, can I have a car? God loves me. He gives me a Rolls Royce. But in a din-based system, din is rules and limitations. A din-based personality says, I don't need your chesed, I don't need your handouts. Tell me what the rules are and I'll do them. Tell me where to go and I'll go there. Tell me what to say and I'll say it. Tell me, tell me how to perfect myself and I can do this on my own. I, I don't need favors, I don't need handouts. I can do this on my own. Rules and limitations is a methodology of pulling back and making yourself greater. Whereas chesed is always focused on what can I do for other people. So Yitzchak says, if I run around Canaan doing chesed for everybody, I'll destroy myself. My father could do it, but it's not good for me. In a din-based system, if I say, listen, God, I need a car. Uh, i got to get to work. I want to take my kids to school. I've got to visit the sick, take food to the poor. Please, can I have a car? God says, not so fast. We, we have rules up here in heaven. Like you, you have to tell me, you know, let's take a look at the book of the record of of this past year, how well have you been using everything I gave you, God says. How well have you been using your time? How well have you been using your intellect? How well have, been you, have you been using your money? 
and let's see whether or not you earn the car. In a, in a rule-based system, if you didn't earn it, you don't get it. In a chesed-based system, forget the rules, I love you, here, take it. So in a din-based system, I say, please, God, can I have a car? God looks up the year I've had and says, listen, you know, I can't give you a car, you don't deserve it. The best I can do is rollerblades. If you work on yourself hard over the next year, maybe we'll talk bicycles, but I can't give you the car, you didn't earn it. But a din-based personality wouldn't want the car. A din-based personality says, if I didn't earn the car, I don't want the car. I don't want handouts or favors, I can do this on my own. See, an Abraham personality that's focused on chesed would walk the streets of Manhattan, see all the people sleeping on the streets who are poor, and say, okay, I'm gonna collect millions of dollars and build a shelter and bring hundreds of people in every night, feed them, clothe them, educate them, help them write resumes and try to get them jobs. That's a chesed-based personality. What's the end result? After 10 years of doing that, everybody's back in the shelter every single night. No, nobody gets a job. It's tremendous chesed, but it's not really accomplishing what he ultimately hoped. Yitzchak says that, well, that'll destroy me. So Yitzchak pulls himself back. Rules and limitations enable you to take yourself to a higher level. So a Yitzchak personality says, okay, I'm not gonna build the shelter. I'm not gonna take a thousand people off the streets every night. It's not gonna ultimately work anyway. I'm gonna to go to grad school, get a PhD in psychology. I'm gonna take myself to a higher level over the next five years. And then five years from now when I'm a psychologist, I'll pick five of those street people and get them off the street forever. It's a different approach, but it works. So step one of creation in terms of God must have been pure chesed. Because if God doesn't have any needs or lacks, he didn't have to create a universe of billions of galaxies, and he didn't have to put people in it because he wasn't bored. He was perfect. So it must be that everything came from pure chesed of God. The whole universe is created as a chesed. Does that make sense? Because God's a giver. But step two was to hold back that chesed enough with rules and limitations so that we can have a relationship with God without being overwhelmed and ruined by too much chesed too fast. So, so, so pure chesed can be destructive, right? Pure din can be destructive. In a din-based system, your father says, dinner will be at 5.05. Your clothes will be neat. Your room will be neat. Your homework will be done. Or you will not eat. That's a din-based home. Of course, you'll destroy your kids like that. That's... It's like running a military academy, it's not, right? So too, too much rules and limitations can be destructive. Where's a hint of that in Yitzchak's family? So if we go back to Yitzchak's family, Yitzchak married Rivka. So he had two sons. He had Yaakov, Jacob, who builds the Jewish people. But then he also had a son he had to throw out. And that was the twin brother, Esau. In English, he's called Esau, but in Hebrew, he's called Esau. So you see, a pure din home doesn't work for Esau, and Esau gets thrown out, right? It's fine for Yaakov, but okay. So we see too much din is destructive. What was the example used for chesed? Rain. So if God loves me and it keeps raining and raining, everyone drowns, right? So you see too much chesed can destroy you. But in a din-based system, God says, listen, if you don't behave correctly, you won't get one drop of rain. Not one drop. So in a din-based system, that generates a drought and everyone dies also. So pure din will destroy you and pure chesed will destroy you, right? So this is called the library's open on Wednesdays, this is the library's closed on Wednesdays. Now, that creates a world of disconnected two-ness. So on Wednesday, I don't know whether I can return my book or not because I, I'm in a world of conflict. Or let's go back to Avram and Yitzchak. And God's running the world with chesed. So if I need a car and he loves me, I end up with a BMW or a Cadillac, right? But if I need a car in a world of din, I get a bicycle or rollerblades. So that's, how's the world running? 
So that's called disconnective tuness. They seem to be in conflict. So how do you resolve it? You have to bring along a third thing. And the third thing is going to be the grandson Yaakov, Jacob. He's going to represent stage three. And Yaakov says, listen, a pure chesed system like my father, my grandfather's can be destructive. A pure and didn't system like my father can be destructive. They're both right, but in their pure forms, it'll destroy you. So I'm going to take a blending of both. And Yaakov's approach is what we call MS or Emet. Emet is truth. And truth is always that the two extremes really aren't extremes. I can balance them out to show it's all about God's oneness. Emet is that a world of disconnection you thought was totally disconnected is really coming from a place of oneness. And therefore, I'll show you how it's unified. So a Yako comes along and says, remember my library metaphor? So a Yako comes along and gives you a third piece of information. He says, oh, did I mention that the library is open in the mornings and closed in the afternoons? So now you know the library is open on Wednesdays and it is closed on Wednesdays. And the first two pieces of information that generated a conflict were never disconnected. You just were missing the third piece of information. So threeness in Judaism fixes up disconnective two-ness. And that's what Yaakov's going to do. That's what MS is. MS, truth, is you see the world as disconnected, but really it's coming from Hashem's infinite oneness. If it's coming from oneness, then the disconnection is fixable. It ultimately has to be a part of one truth. And that's why they always say famously that MS, as a word, is the exact first letter of the alphabet. That's the Aleph. That represents God's oneness. And it's the exact last letter of the alphabet. That's the tough. That represents going as far out into the physical world away from godliness as you can get. Because you can't get any further away from the olive than the end of the alphabet, right? So those are the two extremes. Godliness of the olive, extreme distant physicality of the tough, and mem is the exact middle letter of the alphabet. Mem is the letter that all the other letters pivot around. It's the exact middle point of the alphabet. And therefore, MS represents, I got godliness, I got extreme physicality, but it's being balanced in the middle. So it's all a part of one truth. Now, if you look at the alphabet the way I wrote it on the board, MEM does not look like the middle letter. But that's not because it's not the middle letter. It really is the middle letter. Here, I'll, I'll do that. MEM really is the middle letter. The reason why it doesn't look like the middle letter is because I didn't put the final letters of Hebrew in. Are you familiar with final letters? Are you familiar with final letters? You? Um, there's a final chaf, a final mem, a final nun, and so on and so forth. So when you put the final letters in, mem becomes the middle letter of the alphabet. Okay, so now you, you just have to take my word for it. Okay? Okay, fine. So that's MS. MS is all a part of one truth. Right? So if I can blend a little bit of chesed with a little bit of din, I get a combination that is not destructive anymore. It makes the chesed more powerful when you blend chesed with din. Isn't that interesting? Chesed in its pure form will destroy you because you can ruin somebody by just giving. Can you imagine living in a world where you got everything you could possibly want before you even knew you wanted it? It's totally destructive. It ruins you. And din is like, you know, din is I don't need favors. I don't need handouts. I don't need any help. Just tell me what the rules are. But... You can turn your life into a boot camp or a military academy. That can destroy you as well. Um, it's interesting. There are DIN-based personalities. They sometimes join the military. Sometimes they become policemen or whatever. But um, I remember in the 1970s, even men wore platform shoes. But, you know, a DIN personality doesn't wear platform shoes because in a DIN-based system, if God wanted me to be taller, he'd have made me taller. So... If I'm this height, it must be that this is what I need. Or you know how you can take colored contacts and shift your eye color? So a DIN-based personality would never do that because if God wanted me to fulfill my potential with green eyes, who would have given me green eyes? If he didn't give me green eyes, I guess I don't need them. So a DIN-based personality is, I don't need chess, I don't need handouts, I can do this on my own. So therefore, Yaakov is blending both together to get a package that works. And that's why if you look at Yaakov's family, no one ultimately gets thrown out. 
Yaakov has 12 children, and they build the 12 tribes of the Jewish people. Abraham with a pure chesed home has to throw out Yishmael. Yitzchak with a pure din home has to throw out Esau. But Yaakov, blending the two together, has 12 children who build the 12 tribes. And that's why Yaakov plus his 12 children totals 13. Just mathematically, right? 12 plus 1. <laughs> so 13 is the mathematical value of the word for 1. The word for 1 is echad. And if you add up the value of the word echad, Aleph is the first letter of the alphabet, Ches is the eighth letter of the alphabet, and Dal is the fourth letter of the alphabet. Add them together, one plus eight plus four is 13. So you see that creates a unity because his approach is balancing the two extremes together so that they're not disconnected anymore. And that's the deeper idea of the Hebrew letter Gimel. Gimel is the third letter of the Hebrew alphabet. Gimel is threeness, and threeness is the idea of fixing up a world of disconnected two-ness. Now, watch the pattern here. When we did Aleph, we said Aleph represents God's oneness. So oneness just is. God just is. But then to give you free will, God has to hide himself behind a world of disconnection. So the second stage of creation is to create a world of disconnection and division so that, you know, there's right and wrong, there's night and day, there's good and bad, there's you know, left and right, there's all these abilities to make decisions. You need a world of disconnection to make decisions. So stage two of creation is to create a world of division. But within a world of division, I don't necessarily know how to function because I don't know which way is the right way to go. So stage three of creation is to create a, an ability to fix up the disconnection to show you that the combination is even better. So the pattern of creation is there's a world of oneness, infinite oneness, then there's a world of disconnection division, but it needs to be fixed up again. Oneness, forced to leave it, got to fix it up. That's the one, two, three of creation. Gimel represents the fixing. That's why day one of creation is called good. There's a key tope, it was good, set on day one of creation. On day two of creation, where there was division and disconnection, there is no key tope set about day two. Day two is not called good. Day one is called good, because it's a day of oneness. But day two is not called good because it creates free will through disconnection and division. But that allows for disconnection where you can, you know, God forbid, never make the proper decisions to have a relationship with God. It's a necessary step in creation though. Day three, where I fix up the disconnection of day two, is called good twice. There are two key toves set on day three. One, because day three is good in and of itself. And one is because day three is fixing up the disconnection of day two. Does that make sense? So that, that's why there's so many threes in Judaism. If you look at Judaism, you see there are all these patterns of threes. The Jewish people became a nation when we left Egypt. So Pesach, Passover, is the holiday that falls out in the first month of the year, which is called Nisan. Okay, Nisan's the first month of the year. Then we went through the second month, ER. And the third month was the month we got Torah. So we got Torah in the third month representing fixing up disconnection and division. And then when God gave us Torah, he divided into three different sections. There's the five books of Moses, there's the book of prophets, and the book of writings. And then the Talmud points out that if you look at who got Torah, you'll see it's a third of a third of a third of, you know, we go three, then three, then three. For example, there are three patriarchs, right? But then Yaakov's third son is Levi. And then if you include Levi, you go Levi Kas Amram. And then if you look at Amram, there's Miriam, Aaron, Moshe. So Moshe is a three of a three of a three Right, because there's one that's forced to leave it, got to fix it up. So there's lots of examples of threes like this. In terms of the holiness of locations, there is the holiness of Jerusalem, which is higher. Then there's the holiness of the land of Israel. Then there is everywhere else. Those are some more threes. Um, uh, decision making in a human being just always distills down to the bottom three levels of your soul. 
uh, the bottom three levels of your soul are called uh, nefesh, ruch, and neshama. You make decisions on a neshama level, a ruach level, or a nefesh level. Neshama represents intellectual decisions. Ruach represents your emotional decision making. And nefesh would be the physical side of your decision making. So these are examples of one is forced to leave, you've got to fix it up. So we get all these threes. Um, the Talmud says the world stands on three things, learning Torah, uh, prayer, and um, acts of kindness. You can find lots of examples of um, threes in Judaism. The three holidays, Pesach, Shavuot, Sukkot, where we went to Jerusalem. Um, anyway, we said three patriarchs and so on and so on. So the list goes on and on. Because that's a pattern of creation. You start with infinite oneness. God creates a world of division, but you can't live in a divided world. You've got to fix it up. That's the one, two, three. So therefore, what we see Gimel doing is Gimel's acting like a glue. Gimel is the glue that can bring opposites together so that they're no longer in conflict. That's called rectification of disconnection. It's fixing up disconnection. And therefore, um, a glue only works if a glue has an ability to connect to A, an ability to connect to B, then it can stick A and B together. But if a glue only has an ability to connect to A, but it doesn't have any ability to connect to B, so then it doesn't work. So if, you're, if you need to glue a plastic drain pipe to a concrete wall, you need a glue that sticks a plastic and it sticks to concrete. But if you don't have an ability to connect to both, it's not going to work. So Yaakov is fixing up chesed and din because, you know, in terms of spiritual genetics, he's inheriting both from his grandfather and his father. He's just bringing the two together. So, so chesed balanced with din is a much more powerful chesed. Pure chesed will destroy you. Uh, the example I always use to illustrate how Chesed with limitations is a more powerful chesed is. Let's say you come to Neve to study in our summer program and you're here for six weeks and, um, you know, you, you want to see if God exists, you want to see if Torah is true, you only have a certain number of weeks to do that and you come here and, and in class we say, well, if you be more of a giver, you'll be more like God, you'll have a closer relationship with God. You think, oh, that's fabulous, I can be more of a giver, I'll do chesed. And you volunteer to go to some lady's house who's newly married, and let's say she's pregnant, and uh, she's nauseous, she's laying on the couch, and she's got a toddler running around the apartment, and she can't watch the toddler. So you think, okay, I'll go to her every afternoon, I'll catch her up on laundry, I'll make dinner for her and her husband, I'll do some cleaning, I'll watch the kid, and I'll do chesed every afternoon. So that's fabulous. That's a great chesed. You're doing tremendous things for her. But eventually you'll become so exhausted that you'll stop coming to class in the morning. So you flew 12 hours on a plane to learn some Torah for six weeks. And now you're doing so much chesed that you're so exhausted you're not coming to class. So you're damaging yourself. Plus, since you didn't limit your chesed for this woman, she became totally dependent on you. Six weeks later you get on an airplane, she's going to have a nervous breakdown. So it would have been much better for you and her to say, listen, I know you could use my help every day, but I, I'd become so exhausted, I, I wouldn't be able to come to class and learn Torah, and you'd become dependent on me. So I'll tell you what, I'll come to you on Tuesday afternoons, we don't have class, I'll come to you on Friday mornings, we don't have class. That twice a week will have to be good enough, because I have to learn Torah, and you have to learn how to function. So that limited chesed was much more powerful for you and her than the pure chesed. That's what Yaakov understands. If you blend them together, you end up with a much more powerful chesed. So Yaakov becomes a glue to bring these opposites together. That's what Gimel's doing. Gimel's functioning like a glue to fix up disconnected tunis so that we can function in a world where we see the world's not totally disconnected. And we'll continue with more in the letter Gimel tomorrow. Mm -hmm.